So just some background concerning this individual case. Now, Lucy Letby was accused by the prosecution of rummaging through the hospital's confidential waste bin where Child M's blood gas record had been discarded by a colleague. Yet, this blood gas record was later discovered under Lucy Letby's bed during a police search of her home. It was also the prosecution's case that Lucy Letby had hung around the hospital for well over an hour after her shift had ended in order to collect a paper towel which had detailed resuscitation notes relating to Child M written on it. This paper towel, as I say, along with the blood gas record, was recovered from Lucy Letby's property. The judge refers to the case of Child M, who the court had heard was not an intensive care baby, but put next to Child L on April 9th. At 11am, he had a small posset, as noted by Mary Griffith, and 1.5ml of bile-stained fluid was aspirated at 12.30pm. Child M was to be nil by mouth, a decision made by a registrar. At 3.45pm, Child M received antibiotics, the prescription by Letby and Mary Griffith, and administered by one of the two nurses. At 4pm, Mary Griffith had been preparing a 12.5% dextrose infusion for Child L. The parents had left a few minutes earlier. Child M collapsed at this time. Letby said, quote, Yes, it's an event, it needs to be sorted, and a resuscitation call was put out. Dr Jram was crash bleeped. A nurse colleague said her role was to draw up the resuscitation drugs. She was shown a piece of paper towel referring to entries on clinical notes for times and medications administered. She recognised her handwriting of, quote, adrenaline made. That note was subsequently recovered from a Morrison's bag in Letby's bedroom at the time of her arrest in July 2018, along with a blood gas record for child M. The nurse said the practice was to put the note in the confidential waste bin or the clinical waste bin where it would be incinerated. The judge says it is the prosecution's case that Letby recovered the note from the bin afterwards. Child M was not breathing for himself and required doses of adrenaline in the resuscitation, which lasted under 30 minutes. They reached a point, the judge said, where Child M might not survive. Then Child M suddenly picked up his breathing and heart rate. Dr Jram said he saw pink patches blotches on the abdomen of Child M that moved around. He noticed it was similar to what he had seen with Child A. He first mentioned this in his witness statement. He said his priority at the time was communicating with parents and post-resuscitation care. He said himself and his colleagues sat down on June 29, 2016 to discuss the findings. Dr Jram said someone mentioned air embolus. He researched it in literature and he shared that research the following day with colleagues. In cross-examination, he said he had not appreciated the clinical significance of the skin discoloration at the time. He rejected the assertion he did not note it at the time because it did not happen, or that admitting it was incompetence. He said at the time there were other things going on. He agreed that after Child D had died, Dr Stephen Brewery had carried out an informal review of events at that time, and that Letby was associated with those events. In police interview, Letby denied doing anything to harm Child M. She did not know why Child M desaturated. She said she had been drawing up medications at the time of the collapse. She thought she had taken the paper towel home inadvertently, not emptying her pockets. She said the paper towel might have been put to one side. She denied she had kept it to keep a record of the attack. In evidence, she said Child L and Child M stood out as she had been the allocated nurse for when they were delivered. Child M was not in an allocated space on the nursery, she recalled, and maybe things would have been different if he had been in an allocated space. She did not recall seeing any discoloration, did not recall having any description of skin discoloration being mentioned to her, and any discoloration would have been difficult for her to see. Letby said her taking home the notes was an error and denied taking them from the confidential waste bin. She added she cared for the twins on subsequent days quite frequently, during which time there were no adverse incidents. Paediatric neuroradiologist Dr Stiveros provided agreed evidence in which he said Child M had shown signs of brain damage likely caused by the collapse on April 9th, 2016. 
Professor Owen Arthurs viewed radiographic images for child M and said they could not support or refute an air embolus. Dr Evans concluded there were no concerns for child M prior to the collapse, save for one bilus aspirate for which he was put nil by mouth. He did not believe that caused a collapse as child M's stomach was empty. He believed a noxious substance or air was administered to child M's circulation, i.e. intravenously, and could not explain a natural cause for child M's rapid recovery, ruling out infection. He said that taking into account Dr J Ram's description of the skin discoloration, the cause for child M's collapse was an air embolus. In cross-examination, he accepted there was no empirical research for how air dissipated in the body following a collapse and based it on physiology that cardiac massage would dissipate it. He said if the air goes around the abdominal area, it would result in skin discoloration, and if it heads towards the brain, it can cause neurological damage. He said very little air is required to cause collapse. Dr Sandy Bowen said child M had no markers of infection. She had to find some way to explain how a baby previously well suddenly collapsed and had prolonged resuscitation for which she almost didn't make it, then recovered rapidly. She said the skin discoloration seen by Dr Jram was compatible with air embolus. She said the actual volume to cause a baby to collapse and die is unknown. She said if it was a small volume, it would take some minutes to get to child M in this case, as he was on a slow infusion. In cross-examination, Dr Bowen accepted most babies die in the case of air embolus, but it was not inevitable. She could not think of an alternative medical cause from her differential diagnosis. She said the type of cardiac arrest suffered by child M was incredibly unusual. Mr Johnson says for child M, let's be in her defence statement, said child M was quote, slotted into a space in nursery room one which was full. Child M was apneic and it was not known if he had had a desaturation. A crash call was put out and child M was turned around in the incubator by a nursing colleague to get him onto a monitor. Let be added, she did not notice any skin colour changes in child M at the time. Let be said in her statement she had written up notes on child M's resuscitation on a paper towel which ended up in her pocket and were taken home with her. Let be tells the court it would have been used to write up nursing notes. Let be says child L and child M stood out in her mind at the time as they were the first twins delivered where she was the allocated nurse. Let be agrees child M was not an intensive care baby and had been doing well. Asked if staffing levels were a contributory factor in child M's collapse, Letby replies that the unit was very stretched during the April 9th shift. Asked to clarify by Mr Johnson, she says it was a potential factor. Letby tells the court child M had been in a corner unit in a full nursery, and as nursing and medical staff were very stretched that day, staffing was not at a great level. Letby says she does not know what caused child M's collapse, so rules out a mistake by staff. She says it is hard to say if staff competencies were a factor in the collapse. Mr Johnson says Dr Ravi J Ram observed skin colour changes in child M at the time of the collapse. He says, quote, because child M was darker skinned, it was more obvious. He said child M was pale with pink blotches on the torso that would appear and disappear. He said he noted the most obvious patches on the abdomen. Quote, I noted them when I got there at the start of the resuscitation. He added he had only seen that once before in the case of child A. Let me responds, I did not see anything like that. No. Let me is asked if the lighting was an issue in nursery room one. Let me had told police in interview the lighting was quote poor in room one. Child M was in a darker corner of the nursery, let be tells the court. She added to police, quote, I do remember his colour being harder to assess as he was an Asian baby. Let be tells the court the colour change, if any, was more difficult for her to see. Mr Johnson asks why it was necessary for child M to be in the corner of room one if there were four babies in there with a capacity of four. Letby says there always needs to be an incubator free for emergency admissions in room one. There were four babies in nursery room two, 
three in nursery three, and four in nursery four. The court hears the neonatal unit was at effective capacity. The court is shown a clinical note by Dr Anthony Yuko, made at 10.25am on April 9th. Lebby says she does not remember if she had any involvement with child M at this time. Child M was not Letby's designated baby on this day. A neonatal schedule for Letby on April 9th shows a number of duties Letby had for her designated babies in room 1 between 9 and 9.11am. Letby says one of the designated babies was not a low maintenance baby with complex cannulation issues and was on the ward for a long time. Mr Johnson says Letby has an extraordinary memory for this baby, seven years on, but not for child D who had died. The court is shown a 1.5mm bile-stained aspirate is recorded for child M, following which child M was kneeled by mouth and the nasogastric tube was put on free drainage. Mr Johnson says at 3.30pm a 10% dextrose fluid bag is started for child M. Let be agrees with Mr Johnson there is nothing to suggest insulin was put in this bag. Letby says she cannot recall what nurse Mary Griffith was doing at this time. Mr Johnson suggests this was when Miss Griffiths was collecting a blood sample for child L to be quote podded and sent to a laboratory for analysis. Letby says she couldn't say how long it would take to draw up a 12.5% dextrose solution which in this case was for child L, the twin of child M. Letby agrees it would have been after 3.45pm that the process would have started. Letby denies that it was around 3.45pm that she sabotaged child M. Mr Johnson says the twin's mother said in an agreed evidence statement she had to be taken back to the unit in a wheelchair having been alerted by nurse Yvonne Griffiths and she observed quote one of the doctors was pressing child M's chest. Mr Johnson says this is another case where a baby collapsed when the parents were away. Letby says she was with nurse Mary Griffith at the time of child M's collapse. Letby agrees child M recovered quickly following this collapse. Letby says she did not see skin discoloration and it was not discussed at the time. A colleague had previously told the court child M's blood gas record sheet was disposed of in a confidential waste bin. Asked how it had ended up under Letby's bed at home, Letby says she has never taken anything out of the confidential waste bin. Letby says she does not know how many blood gas records she has taken home. She says it has been put in her pocket and taken home with a handover sheet. She says she probably put it in her pocket and put it under her bed. Asked why, Letby replies, because I collect paper. Letby says household bills and bank statements would be shredded as they were there and then. Other sheets, such as handover sheets, were not thought about. Dr Yuko's records on the resuscitation for child M are shown to the court. Mr Johnson says the record is meticulous, including six adrenaline doses. Mr Johnson says the data for the resuscitation efforts is on the paper towel that Letby took home, which Mr Johnson says he must have had in his hand at some point. Letby agrees. Mr Johnson says that was in his hand at 8.25pm when he wrote up his notes. Letby said she had to stay late that shift for the handover and writing up medical notes for child M. She denies waiting an hour and a quarter to write up those nursing notes or hanging around to get the note Dr Yuko had when writing up the note. Letby denies rooting around in the bin for the blood gas record for child M to take home. She also denies sabotaging child M.